Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on Marxism and popular culture. And so this is probably going to be one of the overall harder or more detailed nuance uh, theories that we're dealing with uh, only because a lot of study around popular culture did emerge from Marxism uh, or at least Marxist theory and kind of studying the, the quote-unquote masses. So it doesn't necessarily matter whether we buy into it or not. There is a lot of things that uh, have been made possible to think about popular culture, and I've referenced it in other uh, mini lectures on the subject. So when we look at Marxism, kind of we, we have to get into this idea of Marxism, political economy, and ideology. And Marxism pro offers up this idea that the dominant ideas in society are those which are drawn up, distributed, and imposed by the ruling class to secure and perpetuate its rule. Now, this can be a conscious act, and but it can also just be a subconscious act or kind of uh, eventually how a society becomes or negotiates its, its power. It isn't necessarily the ruling class all of a sudden comes into existence and says this is how it is, although sometimes that is when you have uh, revolutions and, and rebellions. And so what we have going on here is this base superstructure model wherein the relationship of society is the ba that, that is the base um, functioning within certain elements, in this case material production, the economics, an economic system which reproduces itself, and exploitative class relations. So what all this means is that the if we understand the structure of, of of the society, it functions through the making of goods, a economic system which continually reinforces and reproduces itself, right? So if we look at capitalism, you know, the idea is to accumulate wealth, to then spend wealth, to accumulate wealth, that, kind of a cyclical dynamic like that, and exploitative class relations. And of course, this is that idea of the the more powerfully economic classes taking advantage of lower economic classes and doing this through a variety of ways, whether it's uh, poor working conditions, poor pay, laws that penalize the poor or the, the lower classes much more than the rich. Uh, speeding is actually a really good example of that in that speed, if, if you're caught speeding, and charged with speeding, the fine is more problematic to somebody that's poorer than somebody that's rich. Somebody that makes, you know, a million dollars a year, they get a three hundred, you know, three hundred dollar speeding ticket. That's a joke. Uh, which is why in some countries they've started to switch to a speeding ticket that's proportional, proportionate to one's income. To say, you know, if we want this to impact you, it has to really impact you. All right. So how dynamic or deterministic is this relationship? That is, that relationship of society with those different um, elements. This is something we want to be thinking about, or, or this is something that Marxism offers up as a consideration. So it, it's looking at kind of how society is, f uh, how the different groups within society connect to one another um, and, and exist within those three I items I point to up there. And then the question is, how much is this flexible, that is dynamic, or deterministic, rigid? Is there ways of, of moving beyond just these functionable roles or these, um, these tensions? And the question is, you know, the question then is, is how much does the economy influence and dominate culture? Does this answer, and does this answer that, um, what makes popular culture so popular? So what we want to think about with this is when we're looking at culture, we have to ask ourselves, are those things that are influential and popular a result of this structure, right? The structure in which class or relationships throughout with, you know, relationships of groups within society are mitigated or exist through material production, capitalism, and class relations. Um, or, or potentially driven by, in this case, negative class relations. And how, you know, we move into that question of how dynamic or deterministic, how much, how much flexibility is there within the system, or is it set? Are you, are you unable to, either individually or in mass, to really 
negotiate your way through these relationships. All right. So what we have to understand is ideology is not just a means, is not just ideas or a means of viewing the world, but exists as it played out in the material world. Right. So we've talked about ideology in this course at different times, and we have to understand that ideology does actually have material. Um, D does actually have effects out in the material world and we should be aware of that so in our culture you know we have an ideology of privileging the rich giving them a variety of opportunity you know giving them a variety of opportunities to improve their wealth and at the same time we overburden the poor and you know this ide this ideology of capitalism privileging the rich people would say well no that's just made up but you can see it play out in the material world, in the actual world, in relationships. You can see that you often have, you often end up with people in poor, uh, people of poorer classes or poorer backgrounds are left in housing conditions, environmental conditions that are much more toxic. Therein, jeopardizing their health, therein jeopardizing their ability to make money. Whereas people that are more wealthy are, have the power to not only move out to you know protect themselves but are often the ones making the decisions about hey how about all this waste why don't we put it in you know the the socioeconomic lower part of the town so we see that you know we see an ideology play out or in order for an ideology to be real you do have to find it in the real you have to find it in the material world playing out or that's how we can assess the power and implication of an ideology. Ideology entails actions by people living the imaginary relation to something defined by ideology. Now that sounds really confusing. Uh, the best example I can I can think of of this is that school serves school serves different ideologies, and that 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 dictates what it will teach, how it will teach it, and who it will teach. But it's not ideology until both idea and action have been executed. So here you have that when we look at education or when we look at schools the purpose of school does have or, or does embody different ideologies why do we teach certain subjects well we teach those certain subjects because that's what we believe are the important things or and we decide they're important things because that's part of what we connect to as an ideology right and that dictates you know what what it will teach how it will be taught um, and who will teach it you know if we think about this we've saw we've seen this in the last you know in the last 15 years between no child left behind and race to the top these are both ideal in, in the rise of charter schools these are you know each of these are tapping into different ideologies about school about the relationship between students and you know what it is we want them to do if you look at school its origins are in industrialism right if you look at school school was a, literally a factory to train stu you know to train young adults to go out into the world and be able to have the basic skills to literally work at a factory right and they worked on the same ideology as the factory in which pe you know students come in they work a 6 or 7 hour shift and they are made to learn and do certain actions for those 6 or 7 hours to learn certain skills so that when they finish they if they can go into jobs to essentially follow that same rhythm so this is what we mean is that you know it's this imaginary relation to something defined by ideology what makes a school a school um, is defined by what that ideology is, not just school itself. Uh, so we see capi capitalist ideology is proliferated and reinforced systematically through different inst different institutions, education, mass media, employment. All of these are often driving for individualism, and in driving for individualism, that is also driving for capitalism, right? And, and some of the the purposes and goals of capitalism of having each person a a producer and user of goods to keep that cycle going in one big thing to you know in, in so all of this is just kind of background to um, understanding Marxism and in the big place where Marxism intersects with popular culture is that mass media and popular culture play central roles in the relationship as an ideological state apparatus 
So what we have to understand is that in Marxism, in Marxist theory, has given this, op you know, offers up this idea of studying popular culture as this, essentially this this wing of communication for whatever the the ideology of the state is of the ruling classes. And it says that, you know, these are there to reinforce the messages, the values, the the expectations of that ideology. So mass media so mass media proliferates information that is what you should know knowledge how you should use it and social representations how you're supposed to be and if we think about what we've seen and the variety of of popular culture that we've studied there are certainly elements of that there are certainly elements of an attempt to show the rights and wrongs the proper ways of of doing things Horatio Alger, who I've mentioned before in this course, is a great example in his dime novels of what it means to, you know, do right. And his dime novels were all about, you know, a little bit of, you know, a whole lot of hard work, a little bit of good luck, and you too can raise, you know, rise from rags to riches. So what they proliferate and who they are within the socioeconomic structure are important to the study for popular culture. And so this is what we do a lot in this course is we study what it is, you know, what it is they're they're proliferating, what it is they're they're communicating. Now we're not studying it in conjunction with or as part of pop as part of a Marxist agenda. We're studying it so that we can better understand the culture and the world and that we live in. But some of how we've gotten there was initially through what Marxism did or thought about in terms of popular culture. And I think that question, I mean, I do think that question of who owns the media is important or at least a valuable discussion to have as we study popular culture because when we look at it, our media, and we think of it as mass media, is a very, very small in terms of the invested players, which means the question is how much diversity of ideas and, and thoughts are we getting in popular culture? When you see you're really dealing with six companies that own the vast majority of entertainment, right? You have Time Warner and you can see all the you know, all the different media outlets that Time Warner owns. You have Walt Disney and all the different uh, outlets that they own. Viacom and all the different outlets that they have, CBS and all of their outlets, NBC and everything that they own, News Corporation and everything that they own, right? So it, th there is this question of just what does, um, you know, what it, when we talk about mass media and this idea of it being open and, and lots of opportunities, there's, there's concern around that. A lot of media critics are, are questioning the potential for diversity when you have so small number of companies that own uh, so much. And we have to remember that we do see within mass media uh, a normalization, a legitimization of the current system. No mass media outlet ever really questions the status quo or s questions the existence of um, capitalism or the the you know individualism or if it does it does so in very very simplistic ways um, they, they do so they never give a full substantive critique on any of these outlets because to do so is also to undermine that mass media's existence because so much of that mass media is invested in and generated by capitalism so instead, you know, w what ends up happening is we, we legitimize, we reinvest in the system. So we get shows like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire instead of Who Wants to Be an Anarchist. We get The Bachelor instead of The Independent Self-Satisfied Woman, the, the Independent Satisfied women, Woman, right? So we get these shows that are there to reinforce what we want people to be doing. Why do we want a show like The Bachelor? Well, because we want people, you know, to marry. And not just marry, but have lavish weddings in which, you know, tens of thousand dollars are, are spent. Um, we want people to be millionaires, and we want that, you know, that that's, we want that to happen as a bit of luck, um, but also through, through this work of knowing the answers. Um, but the aspiration to be a millionaire means, you know, people are going to want to spend that money, not just hold on to it. We have survivor instead of happy, relaxing, you know, happy people relaxing at home, right? We have these different shows that represent our, our cultural ideologies at play, and they reinforce the ways in which we live, uh, right? You know, in a, granted, I, you know, some people would argue, well, independent, satisfied woman does not sound like an interesting show. 
but is that because we've been trained to recognize, you know, trained to think the bachelor in that competition for which woman will end up with the guy, uh, you know, a bunch of women fighting for a guy, which on its own has all sorts of feminist critiques to be said about it. Um, but these things, you know, we're trained to see these things as the important pieces. Um, and the, then within all of this question, you know, or within all of this is this question of do people have autonomy and agency? Are they free agents able to make change, able to recognize and make choices, uh, or is this all part of a all part of a program? And the question, you know, the the answer I would give is yes, but often they they too are products of and subject to the larger cultural standards. That is, we do often have agency, but they're often still caught within that larger cultural dynamic, and it's often hard to break out. It's often challenging to break out. Uh, many of us face this at some point when we feel, you know, really cornered to have to do something, even though we don't see the value in it. We do it because we have to. Right? We wear a suit and tie, even though we hate clothing like that, because otherwise we're not going to get the job. Even though the job has nothing to do with wearing a suit and tie, it has everything to do with me being able to get a job, or those other types of challenges that are make us reinvest in the culture, reinforce the system as it is. Alright, that's all we have for this mini-lecture. Thank you very much for watching, and see you in the next video.